Hello everyone and welcome back. My name is Mr. Cobalt and in this video I'm going to be going over electron shielding and effective nuclear charge. So in this video, uh, in my last video, I talked about the Coulomb's law and how that applies to the atom. And so we're going to use that to help us explain shielding and effective nuclear charge. So let's go back to our picture of the Bohr atom here. It's not the perfect or exact model of the atom, but it is. Uh, it does help us explain a few things. And I'll be talking about uh, where it kind of falls apart <clears throat> with respect to shielding and nuclear effective charge. Um, so remember what we were talking about before, that when we have in Coulomb's law, two charges that are uh, the same charge or two, uh, yeah, two charges that have the same sign, uh, they're either both positive or both negative, then they're going to be repelling each other. And so the distance there, they want to be farther apart. So uh, increasing the distance between them is going to end up uh, lowering the potential energy. So that's going to be make this uh, less positive. So remember, if this is a minus and a minus, minus times minus gives you a positive. So increasing the distance between the particles would lower the potential energy. So here in my atom, we have these two inner electrons. And these inner electrons we're going to call core electrons. So these are your core electrons. And the outermost shell we call the valence shell. So the valence shell uh, is your outermost shell and the electron in the valence shell or electrons in the, in the valence shell are your valence electrons. Oops. Valence electrons. So you can see that the electrons on the inside, these core electrons, are going to want to repel the valence electron on the outside. And so they're going to want to get a larger distance from each other in order to lower the potential energy. But at the same time, all of the electrons are attracted to this proton. And here I have a lithium atom that has three protons, three electrons, so it's neutral. So these three protons are attracting the electrons. But are they attracting the electrons uh, equally? Is this uh, nucleus attracting these electrons uh, the same way that it's attracting these? Does it attract all electrons with the same amount of force? And the answer is no. And the reason for that is shielding. What do I mean by shielding? What I mean by shielding is the, the repulsive effect of the inner electrons on the outer electrons for the most part, right? So what's happening here? So because of these inner electrons, these core electrons that are inside uh, in this lower energy level or sublevel here, uh, they are effectively going to be repelling this uh, electron away from the nucleus while at the same time the nucleus is attracting that electron towards it. So in effect, what you have is these two negative electrons are counteracting the attractive force of the nucleus. So if these two electrons were not here, then this electron would feel the full force of three positive charge of the nucleus. But because these two inner electrons are there, they are having a repulsive force. So they're pushing uh, the electron away. So that you got this push and you've got this pull. And the pushing of these inner core electrons is canceling out some of the pull of the nucleus. And so this electron here cannot feel the full force of the three protons. It's more like it's feeling uh, one for uh, uh, the, the force of one proton, one positive proton, because you, the way you can think about it is that these two negative electrons are canceling out uh, one proton each in the nucleus. 
So this negative electron is canceling out one of the protons, the uh, positive attractive force of one proton, and the repulsive force of this electron is canceling out one of the attractive uh, forces of the other proton. So uh, effectively, it would be as if this electron here is only feeling one proton instead of three. Now, that is not a perfect, um, it's not a perfect shielding. So you can kind of see this as a shield around the nucleus, preventing this electron to feel the full attractive force of the nucleus. But it's not perfect because we're, we don't really have a Bohr atom. So according to the Bohr atom, we have our electrons on these fixed orbits, but in reality, it's a quantum mechanical model. The, uh, the electrons exist in probability spaces, right? So each electron has a certain probability of being somewhere in this space. So even though we have in this picture, this electron being out here, this electron has a probability of being somewhere in here as well. So I could erase this electron and I could put it in there. So this electron, this valence electron does have a probability of being inside the shield, inside the shield. And so in this case here, this electron would now be feeling the full force of the three protons. But again, it doesn't stay there, it moving around all over the place. So it could end up back out here again, right? Not exactly here, but it could be out here somewhere where now it's being shielded by the electrons on the inside once again. So it's not a perfect shielding, but we can simplify it by thinking of it as a perfect shielding and thinking, oh, if these two electrons are on the inside, they are going to push the electron on the here away. And that's like canceling out one proton each. Okay, so uh, an analogy I like to use is one of tug of war, right? So here we have our electron and here we have our proton and they're pulling on the rope, right? So when they're pulling on the rope, both of them feel a force in the rope. So we're going to look at it from the perspective of the electron being pulled by the proton. So right now, the proton is pulling on the electron, and the electron is feeling the force in the rope, right? We've all done tug of war, hopefully, and so we know, what, you know what's going on here. So when you're pulling on the rope, you feel the other people pulling on the rope. So you feel a force, and it's pulling you in a certain direction. It's pulling you that way, right? So now think about it this way. What if I, being you know, uh, a shielding electron, right? And what, what if I go and I push on this guy here? So this is the proton and I push in the opposite direction. So the proton here is pulling this way. So if I, if I draw that here, so The proton is pulling this way, and so therefore the electron feels a certain force. But what if I come behind the, the Mr. Proton here, and I, I start to push in the opposite direction? What happens if I start pushing that way? What happens to the force felt by Mr. Electron? I, I push here, I'm pushing, I start to push a little bit. What happens to the force felt by the Mr. Electron on this side? We would all say that Mr. Electron is feeling less force, right? Why? Because now I am pushing in the opposite direction that Mr. Elect Mr. Proton is pulling. So I am counteracting or I'm canceling out some of his pulling force by pushing him from behind, right? So therefore, the Mr. Electron is not going to feel as much force in the rope, okay? It's not a perfect analogy, but I think it works, and hopefully that helps you understand what's going on with the shielding effect of the inner electrons, okay? Now, what about other electrons? So here I have lithium with three protons. What if we add a proton and an electron to the atom? So here I have, I'm going to have four protons, and now I add another 
electron. Let's add an electron here. So now I have beryllium. So my, now my atom is beryllium. So now I feel, uh, now I have four protons, two electrons, and, and two electrons here. So I have two core electrons still. And now I have two valence electrons. So just as before, we can think of the two electrons as canceling out. These two inner electrons are canceling out two protons here. So each negative charge is repelling the electrons away. And so it's counteracting the attractive force of one of the protons. So each of these inner electrons will cancel out one of the protons. And so that leaves an effective nuclear force or effective nuclear charge of two. So let's go back to lithium, right? So lithium, lithium had three protons, right? So if we think of these two electrons as canceling out one proton each of charge, so that would mean that this electron here would be feeling what is called an effective nuclear charge of plus one. And again, it's an effective nuclear charge because um, this electron here on the outside um, only feels the effect of one proton, right? Again, it's not exactly one proton, but to simplify the picture, we can think of the shielding as being perfect, even though it's not. So if the shielding is perfect, then both of these electrons would cancel out the attractive force of two protons here. And so then this electron would be only feeling an effective force of plus one on, on it from the, the nucleus, right? So what if we go to the next one, we go back to beryllium. And so here, we now have four protons, and we'll put our electron back here. We have two electrons here. Now, these two valence electrons will shield each other to some extent, but it's, uh, it's minimal, and we, we tend to ignore it. Why can these uh, shield each other? Well, again, these electrons are not always on this orbit. They can be somewhere in here. So if this electron ends up in here, then this electron will also shield that electron from the nucleus. So these will shield each other to some extent, but we typically ignore that shielding, but it's there. Um, so what happens now? In this case, we still have our two inner electrons, our core electrons. So again, that's gonna cancel out two uh, of the protons as far as attractive force on the electrons. So if those cancel out, then each of these electrons here would be feeling something like a plus two charge. So now the effective nuclear charge is plus two um, because the number of shielding electrons hasn't changed. So we can add more and more valence electrons to the outside. That's not really going to affect the shielding. Um, it does, again, it does but we're gonna ignore that for this, for the uh, nuclear charge, the effective nuclear charge to make the, the math simpler, okay? So both of these electrons will feel something like a plus two charge from the, pro, from the nucleus, not the full four, because these two electrons are shielding the uh, protons or shielding this nucleus uh, from, from the electrons. Out, from the electrons out here. So this would be an effective, these electrons would feel an effective nuclear charge of plus two rather than the full plus four in the nucleus. If we keep going, if we add another proton, so if we have five protons, and so then we add another electron here, let's add a third electron there. So now we have four pro five protons. Now we have boron. So here's our atom boron. Again, the number of core electrons hasn't changed. We're only adding valence electrons on the outside. 
And so now we have five protons. We have two electrons, core electrons, that are uh, uh, shielding these three electrons from the protons. So if we cancel out two of the protons from these two electrons, then the uh, amount of attractive force felt by these electrons is going to be a plus three. And so here we have a plus three nu effective nuclear charge felt by these electrons uh, towards, the, towards the nucleus. And we can keep going and on and on. So what we notice as, as I'm going across the periodic table, so I started with lithium, and then we did beryllium, and then boron, and then next would be um, nitrogen, and then oxygen, and then so on and so forth. Every time we add a, a new uh, proton to the nucleus, we're not adding any more electrons on the inside. So there's the, the shielding stays pretty much the same um, as far as the number of core, uh, core electrons go. So we're only going to cancel out two protons because we have two core electrons here. So the more protons we put into the nucleus without changing the number of core electrons, uh, that will increase the, uh, the effect of nuclear charge. Okay, so let's go over to sodium here. It's the same thing with sodium. So sodium begins the... Uh, is the first atom in the third period, third row of the periodic table. So same thing happening here. So sodium, oh, I forgot to change that. So sodium has 11 protons, and we have 11 electrons, so it's balanced. And so what's happening here, again, we have the core electrons. So these two inner uh, energy levels here uh, are core electrons. And here we have the valence electron on the outside. And so here, uh, just like over here, we have two, two core electrons that are shielding these electrons out here on the valence shell. Uh, these electrons here are shielding this electron, the valence electron, here. So again, if, you, if we take the number of core electrons and we assume that each core electron cancels out one of the protons, right? So we have the, each proton has an attractive force pulling on the electron, this valence electron. But then again, each of the uh, negative electrons in the core are pushing that electron away. So that pushing by the electron, the core electrons counteracts the uh, attractive force of the proton. So if we think a one-to-one -one relationship, then for every core electron that you have, each core electron is canceling out a proton in the nucleus. So if we count the number of core electrons, one, two, three, four, and we get 10, that means our 10 core electrons is canceling out 10 protons. And so this electron is feeling an effective nuclear charge we call that Z effective or ZF, the effective nuclear charge is going to be a plus one. Over here, it was a plus three, right? So Z, so the effective nuclear charge is a plus three for this atom here. Here it's a plus one because each of these core electrons is canceling out the attractive force of one proton each. Again, it's not exactly a perfect shield, right? So these electrons are always moving around in this space. There's always a probability that this electron here will be somewhere here. So it's not a perfect shielding, um, but we think of it as perfect just to make things simple and more understandable. Um, <clears throat> so again, we could uh, change this to magnesium, so we could add a proton here, add another electron, uh, valence electron, so now we have magnesium, right? But now we have uh, 12 protons in our nucleus, but we also now have, uh, we also still have 10 electrons, 10 core electrons, so now... Uh, for magnesium, 
the 10 electrons, the 10 core electrons is going to cancel out 10 protons, leaving two protons of a worth of attractive force. So now these two electrons are going to feel a Z effective or effective nuclear charge of plus two instead of a plus one. So again, uh, we could do we could do the next one. So instead of magnesium, we could throw in uh, I believe aluminum. Let me check my periodic table. Yes, aluminum. So if we do aluminum, and so now we have thirteen protons. And we'll throw in another electron there. So we're adding valence electrons to our outer shell. So now that we have 13 protons, the 10 core electrons will cancel out 10 protons there. Now that leaves three protons that are not canceled out. And so that would be the effective nuclear force felt by the outer electrons. And we would call that an effective nuclear charge of plus three. So these electrons, instead of feeling the full force of 13 protons, a positive charge of 13, these core electrons cancel out or shield uh, the uh, 10 of those protons. So they're shielding the nucleus from these three. And so you feel not the 13, but a, a, a charge of three. So that's what we mean by shielding and effective nuclear charge. I hope this was helpful. I hope you uh, learned something from this video. If you like my videos, please hit the like button, uh, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, right? So right up here, the notification bell. And uh, make a comment in the comment section. Let me know what you think and ask me questions if you've got any. Thanks for joining me. Have a great day.